and I developed the colorimeter as a means of finding a tint to treat the visual disturbances that a lot of people with reading difficulties have. It's been controversial ever since really. It started in controversy and we've been gradually trying to lift it out of the mire of controversy and that takes a very long time. I think you can explain the controversy um, really under four headings. Who, when, what and why. Now the who of it is who are you treating with coloured lenses? We treat people with visual stress and the latest evidence we have is it's only about one in five people with dyslexia and it's much rarer in people that don't have dyslexia. So other people have said this is a treatment for dyslexia, which is no evidence that's the case and most people who work in this field have never argued that's the case. That's the delicate balance we have to draw. There's something called visual stress that is uh, comorbid with a lot of neurological conditions that affect vision and until we can better identify visual stress as an entity then we're not going to be able to hit as it were get the right people um, and treat them. The when is when do people get the problems with text that the colour helps? Well it tends to only be when children get to a certain age when they're looking at small text, crowded text and if they're looking at it for long periods. The what is what helps them and the what is coloured filters but in some cases they need to be precisely defined. Not in every case but in some. So if you use a system that doesn't cater for that precision then you'll think that they're not working and then why has been the other reason for controversy. If you don't understand a mechanism it doesn't make sense and this is where Arnold's work has really been groundbreaking in uncovering the mechanism of cortical hyperexcitability. There is an objective correlate of the discomfort that people report in terms of the oxygenation of the brain which we can measure using functional magnetic resonance imaging or near-infrared spectroscopy and both show that when someone's uncomfortable looking at something the <clears throat> brain uses more oxygen and uh, when you provide the appropriate colour uh, it uses less which is nice and incidentally it also shows that if you provide the slightly wrong colour it doesn't work. The interesting thing now though is we're talking about reading problems actually uh, most of the patients who are referred to my practice uh, for colorimetry which is perhaps one or two a week are not referred to do with reading problems most are referred uh, by neurologists because of people with visually precipitated migraine or epilepsy or other other neurological conditions so the use of the colorimetry and optometric practice is broader than uh, previously we thought I think the guidance produced recently by professional bodies, so by the College of Optometrists and by the AOP, is very useful. I think it's helpful for practitioners to have that guidance. As you'd expect, the emphasis is slightly different. The college guidance is more cautious, more academic. The AOP guidance is more clinician-friendly, more user-friendly for the busy clinician to use in their practice. But I think both of the guidelines make some useful, important points. They say, first of all, it's not a treatment for dyslexia. Agree completely. Secondly, they say, you should rule out conventional optometric problems first. And we've always said this, but it can't be stressed enough, that if you get a child that's reporting symptoms with text, and these are the children we're interested in, you should first of all look for the routine things like refractive error, binocular vision problems, and so on. And only look at colour as a potential treatment once you've ruled out those other factors. You need to make it clear that the evidence for this is not strong. That's the emphasis of the college guidelines. But actually, that's something optometrists do and need to do with most things they do. We've got a paper in press and optometry in practice looking at 10 commonplace optometric activities. If you ask the question for how many of those is there strong evidence, it's two or three. So most things optometrists do, there's not strong evidence for it. That's slightly appropriate because the risk of what we do is much lower than the risk, for example, of drugs and surgery but it does mean that we need to convey uncertainty to patients. We need to explain what's controversial. Uh, we need to explain um, evidence-based practice. Now, evidence-based practice is not just about research. It's about integrating research with the clinician's experience and with the, practitioner, with the patient's and parent's wishes too. 
So it's all about recognising the individual practitioner, the individual patient, and discussing with them pros and cons and areas where there's some uncertainty, uh, but also feeding in that practitioner's experience too. Medicine is conservative and that's appropriate. Uh, one does need a lot of evidence for something that is uh, almost unbelievable really, uh, and, until one starts to think about the neurology involved. And when one does, you begin to realise that we know very little indeed about the interaction between colour and spatial vision. Until we know more, we won't be able to predict which particular colour people choose. And unfortunately, we haven't found uh, a correlate of that colour yet. Uh, when we do, of course, it'll help us enormously to get to the mechanism. If you do want to get involved in this, there are some good papers that you can read that really give you a good summary. The book that Arnold, Wilkins, Peter Allen and myself wrote, that gives a good starting point. But the more recent papers also need to be looked at. And I think the Delphi study is a way of coming up with some diagnostic criteria. That's a really good starting point because it will help practitioners identify the genuine cases from the non-genuine and that is a real challenge and you know that's something where uh, every practitioner that does this needs to be a bit skeptical when they're with the individual patient and, and not take at face value everything the patient says. So if a patient says a coloured filter helps, listen to that but quiz it, interrogate it, test it uh, and find out whether they're a genuine case or not. There's going to be some case studies published in optometry today, later in the year, that should help to throw some light on this and give some real life examples that will help to ex exemplify what can be done and just as importantly, what can't be done with coloured filters.